and welcome. Um, uh, apologies for the um, delay in starting this meeting. Um, my name is Barbara Blake. I'm the chair of this committee and I'm a Seven Sisters Ward Councillor. So if we can start with introductions. So starting from my left with the committee, please. Grace Rice, Tottenham Hill Councillor and Vice Chair. Councillor Ajda Ovat, member for Northumberland Park. Matt White, councillor for Tottenham Central. Alex Worrell, councillor for Stroud Green. Nicola Bartlett, councillor for West Green. John Bevan, councillor for Northumberland Park. Councillor Buxton, uh, councillor for Crouch End. Councillor Luke Quilly Harrison, Crouch End. Councillor Say, can you introduce yourself? Councillor Yvonne Say, um, White Hart Lane. If I can ask the officers present um, to introduce themselves. So on my left, start from my left. Good evening, Matthew Barrett, uh, Planning Solicitor. Rob Shostovsky, Assistant Director for Planning, Building Standards and Sustainability. Robbie McNocker, Head of Development Management. James Mead, Planning Officer. Richard Trescott, Design Officer. Suzanne Kimmon, Climate Change Officer. Fiona Ray, Acting Committees Manager. Thank you. So we're on to item one, which is filming at meetings. This meeting is being recorded. All registered speakers should be aware that they will be recorded for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting. Item two, um, the one to planning protocol. Um, members and speakers are requested to note the information set out at item two on the agenda. Could you please note that? Item three, any, um, so apologies for absence have been received from Councillor George Dunstall. Item four, there are no items of urgent business. Items five, do any members have any declarations of interest? Um, so we're on to item uh, uh, um, six, which are the um, uh, planning applications. So we move on to. Chair, can I ask why is there no minutes of the last meeting? Because they're, they're, they haven't been produced yet, but they will be by the next meeting. You mean they haven't been produced yet? They're not ready yet, Councillor Rice, Why but they not? will be. Because we've had people have had people have been on annual leave. Oh, okay, right. Thank you. So item seven, which is um, 108 Vale Road, that's um, HGY. 2022-0044, that's pages 1 to 78. And the proposal is an application for full planning permission for a comprehensive redevelopment of the site to provide four buildings comprising flexible light industrial floor space, class E, and storage and distribution units, class B8, together with car and cycle parking, plant and all highways, landscaping and other associated works. Uh, the recommendation is to grant and the uh, planning officer James Mead will present the report. Thank you. So, so the site is located on the southeastern side of Vale Road and measures approximately 0.8 hectares in area. The land to the northeast of the site is also within the same ownership. This is some aerial photography of the site. From this, you can see that the site is currently fully hard surfaced and is occupied by approximately 130 storage containers. The site is also used for car parking. 
This is an aerial, aerial view from the front of the site. You can see that the site is occupied by storage units, the storage containers from this image. To the right hand side of the frontage is the Maynard's building, which is a commercial building and also a locally listed building. To the left hand side of the frontage is the existing Florentia closing clothing village. And on the opposite side of Vale Road are various commercial buildings. Some of these have been adapted for residential use at upper floors. This is an aerial view from the rear of the site. You can see e Ede Road running along the bottom of that image. The buildings along Ede Road to the rear of the site are generally in commercial use. This is a street scene photo taken from outside the existing Frontier Clothing Village. These are further street view photos showing the occupation by the storage containers. This is a photo from within the site showing the use of the site for car parking. And this is a photo of the existing Frontier Clothing Village which neighbours the site. In terms of the key planning policy designations of constraints, the site is within a locally significant industrial site. Such land is reserved for business uses, so reserved for B1, now use, uh, now use class E, so light industrial uses, B2, general industrial uses, and B8, storage and distribution uses. The site's also within the Seven Sisters area of change, and two site allocations do neighbour the site. These site allocations relate to employment development and warehouse living. Moving on to the, de the proposed development, the development is for the removal of the existing storage containers and the erection of four buildings providing flexible light industrial uh, units and storage and distribution units. An internal yard area will also be provided in, uh, together with an internal access route. Car parking and cycle parking will be delivered and landscaping and public realm upgrades are proposed. The image on in the top right hand corner there shows the layout of the site. You can see block D fronting onto Vale Road. Block C sits along the western boundary of the site with the northwestern elevation front also fronting onto Vale Road and block A and B sit to the re rear of the site laid out in an L shape. The scheme will, will provide, uh, provide 9,363 square metres of business floor space. This floor space will be split between the proposed uses with 4,736 square metres being allocated for light industrial uses and the remaining 4,627 square metres uh, proposed to be used for flexible light industrial and storage and distribution uses. The scheme is estimated to deliver, to deliver approximately 250 new jobs and business space for approximately 54 businesses. The overall, the scheme can be viewed as an extension to the existing commercial um, element of the of Frontier Clothing Village. In terms of how the uses would be set out on site, the uses would be provided over three, four, three floors. So the ground floor, a mezzanine floor, and the first floor. The ground floor and the mezzanine floor would be in flexible light industrial and storage and distribution uses. So this means that they could be used for either of those uses. It's worth pointing out that the ground floor units fronting onto Vale Road within block D are reserved for solely light industrial use, and this is to create a active frontage onto Vale Road. The first floor is proposed to be solely in light industrial use. These are some street seat, the streets and elevations of the proposed development. You can see block D on the left hand side and block C on the right hand side. The vehicle access into the site would run between block D and block C and the pedestrian access is located to the left hand side of the frontage. These are the elevation drawings for block A and block B. Block A will have an asymmetric roof form and block B is made up of several different pitched roof elements. Access to the ground floor units will be taken by the doors and the roller shutters, whereas access to the first floor will be taken via lifts and walkways. These are the elevations for Block C and Block D. These are the elevations that front into the yard area. Again, access will be taken by the doors for the ground floor units 
and via the lift and stairway for the first floor units. Block C will have a pitched roof and Block D will comprise of several uh, different mono pitched sloping roofs. These are some visual visualizations of what the site might look like internally. So moving on to the principal development, the light industrial and storage and distribution uses are entirely, entirely appropriate within a locally significant industrial site. They accord with the land use designation of the site. The intensification of business and industrial uses is supported in principle and is supported by policies at all, all levels. The scheme will deliver an increase in employment floor space, will deliver higher quality business floor space and will deliver a range of unit sizes. The scheme will also contribute to the council's targets for employment floor spaces and will contribute to the overarching economic objectives of the borough. The remnant is considered acceptable in principle. In terms of the design and appearance, the scheme has been through the pre-application process and has been subject to quality to, to the QRP, to the quality review panel. That image shows the initial proposal pre-application stage with the application proposal at the bottom there. It's worth noting that the QRP final comments were supportive and any queries that the QRP did raise are addressed in the Office of the Board. This is a, an image to show the massing of the proposed development. Um, you can see that surrounding buildings are generally of two storey and three storey form and therefore the three storey form of the proposed development is considered to be in keeping with the scale of built form in the surrounding area. This is further highlighted on the drawing at the bottom of the page which shows that the buildings would sit below the height of the adjacent Maynard's factory building. The, the surround the surrounding area and the surrounding streets in is made up of a variety of different buildings as shown here. There's some flat roofs, some pitched roofs, some asymmetric roof forms and therefore there's, there's no real distinct character to this area and it's not considered that proposed development would be out of keeping having regard to this. In terms of the materials and the detailing, the main material that's proposed to be utilised is metal cladding with this installed to the roof and the walls of the building. Fibre cement panels are proposed to be applied to the ground floor of block D, so to visually break up this elevation. Bright colours are proposed throughout the development, so to create a distinctive and unique character for the development. These bright colours will also relate well to the existing frontier village. Moving on to impact on amenity. It's considered that the new uses would integrate well with the existing commercial uses in the surrounding area. It's noted that the QRP did query the relationship with the, of the proposed development with the adjacent Maynard's factory building. Officers have considered this and have come to the view that the new development would be a sufficient distance from the Maynard's factory so to avoid impacting this commercial building. The scale of the development is not so substantial that there would be a harmful impact, a harmful material impact on nearby residential uses and a satisfactory noise survey has been provided. A condition is recommended to, that seeks to control noise generated from the site. Moving on to parking and highways, the site has a pit hour rating of two. You can see from the image there that Manor House Underground Station is located to the southwest of the site and Haringey Green Lanes Overground Station is located to the west. Seven Sisters Road runs to the east and there are bus services available on this route. Overall, the development is estimated to generate 720 daily trips to the site and the transport assessment predicts that only 5% of these journeys would be via the car. It's proposed to deliver a low level of parking within the site, so to reduce the attractiveness of driving to the site. The sustainable travel can be secured via tra the travel plan and a contribution is also proposed to sustainable tra transport initiatives. In regards to parking, the image on the left hand side shows the proposed parking layout. It's worth pointing out that the parking delivered on the site would be shared between the existing Frontier Clothing Village and the proposed development with 19 spaces allocated for Frontier Clothing Village and 22 allocated to the proposed development. 
six additional spaces would be provided for delivery and six additional spaces for visitors. Ten charging points are proposed throughout the site. And this is in line with the London plan requirements. 86 cycle parking spaces are proposed with cycle storage facilities provided in the yard area and a second cycle storage facility provided on Vale Road. The provision of 86 cycle parking spaces would again exceed the London plan requirements. Uh, in terms of the access arrangements, there is currently four accesses from Vale Road into the site. It is proposed to remove three of these accesses with one access retained for, for access into the site. It is proposed that cars access the site via Vale, vale Road and then move through the site through a one-way route with exit onto Overbury Road. Pedestrian access will be taken from the left-hand side of the frontage. In regard to energy and climate change, Overall, the scheme would deliver an 89% reduction in carbon dioxide emission, emissions. It's proposed to install photovoltaic panels to the south facing roof slopes of the building. And high thermal standards are proposed for the building. A temporary communal gas fired heating system is proposed prior to connection to the decentralized energy network. An overheating assessment has been provided and is tested several of the, un of the proposed units. All of the units tested passed the overheating requirements. To, to ensure the development is built out in a sustainable way, conditions can be attached requiring an energy strategy and a sustainability review energy plan and carbon offset can be secured via the legal agreement. In terms of landscaping, uh, it, it is proposed to incorporate planting across the front of the site with street trees also proposed to be planted along Vale Road. Planting is also proposed within, within the site. This planting together with other ecological enhancements would deliver a 326% increase, uh, net gain in biodiversity. The hard standing to, uh, to be used throughout the site would be permeable. In summary, officers consider the, the application to be acceptable in principle. There's strong policy support for the provision of employment space and the intensification of industrial uses in a locally significant industrial site. The scheme is considered to equate to high, a high standard of design, which would improve on the appearance of the site and the street scene while making a positive visual contribution to the wider locality. Nearby businesses would not be compromised and the living conditions of residential properties would not be materially impacted. The scheme seeks to promote sustainable travel. A number of sustainability measures are proposed to be incorporated to the development with an 89% reduction in carbon emissions achieved. Officer's recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to conditions and the Section 106 legal agreement. And Chair, just to follow that, um, I'm just going to give a quick presentation on our um, 3D mapping software of the scheme. Um, so um, members won't have seen this before. This is um, our View City 3D mapping. So this has a um, 3D massing model um, of all the existing buildings in the borough and um, allows us to drop in proposed buildings such as this um, within the model to um, see that the form that that takes within its surroundings. Um, I'll just drop into some of the um, street views. So that allows um, just to travel along the road and understand the impact this building would have um, within its context. So as you can see, um, for the existing Ferrandia Clothing Village on the left um, with the, the building in, in light blue and then further buildings in green beyond that. So repairing that existing frontage and um, of a height comparable with existing buildings. Um, just if I take you to one of the other views coming the other way. Again, just showing that in its context. Um, and I think really the building, we've looked at other viewpoints and is largely um, absorbed into the surroundings quite comfortably without any impact on, on further views, but i um, happy to, to look at the, um, the buildings from any further points, and we will have this for the um, next item on the agenda as well. Thanks. Um, so we do have the applicant here, Victoria Obart. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there are no objectors. Um, so it's um, clarification questions from the committee, and you can ask questions to the applicant as well. Councillor Corley Harrison. Thank you, Chair. Um, one for the officers. Um, 
it references a UGF of 0.012 um, below the mayor's guidelines. So I'm just um, wondering whether there were uh, whether a that includes the street trees that are going in on Vale Road rather than on site to come to that score. And um, other than the hard standing, what work was done to increase that score? Green roofing or anything like that. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, yeah, a, a good question. I think um, this is a good example of a, a, a policy conflict that um, members have to grapple with. That there's um, a non-compliance with the urban greening factor policy that we find to be outweighed by the benefits of the scheme in, in terms of employment. Um, so, you know, we, we've taken the view that that one is more important in terms of generating this level of employment and, and intensity on the site. Um, that the um, adding additional greening has been explored and you know has been raised. Um, by the QRP, um, but ultimately to get the, this level of, of density and, and to get the site to, to operate and be viable, it, it wasn't possible. Um, because the street trees are off the site, they, they're not included. So really that, that's not reflective of um, the, the actual urban greening factor, which, which is introducing those onto the street frontage. Councillor Rice. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I just wondered from the officers whether there's some talk about cladding being put on this site. Taking Renfrew in mind, is there not any cladding that covers industrial buildings as opposed to domestic dwellings? And the second thing, there's some talk of care free. Uh, but I thought there were people already living there in the work built units. And if any of those have cars, how would they fall into the car-free arrangements? Would they have to get rid of their car because they don't become a car-free zone? Just to take your first question on, on cladding, uh, um, I hope I've understood you correctly in terms of is this an appropriate cladding for an industrial area? Was that was that your question? Um, yes, yeah. So. Um, I can ask the design officer just to, to explain a bit more, perhaps on, on the design approach. But yes, this is a um, a cladding that is robust and, and designed to to um, survive well in an industrial area and, and reflect that industrial aesthetic in the area. Um, in terms of the car free, that wouldn't impact on any of the existing developments. It, it will just be that um, there's a designation on on this site. Um, everything else that that's operating um, under the same ownership. Is, is outside the the the, um, the planning application red line the site location so um wouldn't be affected by that designation richard would you like to just say a bit more about the approach to materials okay yes um we have um got a fairly detailed the standard but fairly detailed condition on materials um and you know that will require um both uh, approval of both uh, material samples and one to twenty or, or one to ten details of, of the various key elements. Um, obviously, it's got a metal cladding and cementitious panel cladding. Um, they're both relatively non-flammable materials. Uh, that, uh, in gen general, industrial cladding has not been um, has not suffered from the same problems that a lot of um, residential cladding has done uh, following the discovery of um, bad building practices uh, following the Grenfell fire. Um, so I would not anticipate it being a problem because uh, the uh, industrial buildings have, have have been shown to be robust in terms of um, cladding and fire risk. Obviously, a lot of industrial buildings contain very flammable processes and things, and uh, you know there've been situations where the building inside has, has had a catastrophic fire. Catastrophic fires will carry on happening in industrial buildings, I'm sure, but. Um, uh, there the, the shouldn't be a problem in this situation because they should be the building control building regulations have shown to be robust for protecting neighbours from industrial buildings uh, having catastrophic fires by and large. Yeah, I'd just like to ask you that uh, in future matters such as this, the cladding arrangement, whether it's domestic or, or, or industrial, the material should be before the committee at the decision making meeting so they can satisfy themselves what's being agreed is appropriate. 
Chair, Ch if I could on that, um, quite often we don't have the details of, of the exact product um, because the, um, the development needs to go out to tender and um, that, that depends on, on who the, the supplier is. Um, but we could certainly have some more clarity on um, on the appearance and, and detail um, indicatively um, with, within your application pack. Councillor Buxton. Thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, following on from Councillor Rice's point um, about the car parking, do we know who is currently using the car parking spaces uh, on the site? And um, uh, do we know where these cars will be displaced uh, when the when the development is done? Will they, is it used by surrounding uh, buildings or is it used by the site itself? Does that make sense? Chair, for me, I think that would be a, a good question for the applicant to answer, if we, we could bring them in. Um, we also have our, our transportation officer available to um, speak to the impact of that. So, Chair, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Um, so it, it's a mixture of that councillor in terms of the, some of the car parking is used by the industrial units and some is being leased out. I think the majority of the ones you saw in the photograph, they're not related to the operation of the industrial unit. The idea is to make a more sustainable development by um, capping the car parking. So there will be sufficient car parking in terms of the new development to comply with the London plan. And I think Councillor Rice talks about the car free. It's not residential. It's actually to stop uh, you know, units being able to apply for car parking spaces on street and utilize the car parking spaces provided within the site. Uh, the applicant is also committed to having a booking system where if our visitors need to actually have a car all day, they can book a car parking space on site to cater for that demand. But the idea here is to promote more sustainable modes of transport to and from the site and to have short term parking to support the industrial elements of the units. If you could, do you want to follow up from that? Thank you, Cassa. Um, sorry, my name is Tom Horn from DPI and I work with um, Victoria. Um, I mean, there's probably not a huge amount to add to um, what Maurice has said on the on the parking side of things. It's a uh, commercial lease at the moment. So um, rather than be displaced, I guess the concern might be to surrounding streets or something like that. They would literally be moved en masse to another commercial site which provides car parking. Um, I think it's, um, is it Volvo is the, the, the current guys that lease it? So it's simply just a winding up of that lease and they'll move on to another location. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Thanks. Um, this is partly answered by what's come before. Um, this might be a question for our transport officer again, and maybe the applicant. Um, I just wondered if you could clarify a little bit exactly what is meant by this sentence. Um, sufficient car and cycle parking would be provided to ensure that sustainable travel would be prioritised. Just so I could envisage a little bit what what is meant by the sort of the temporary parking. There's a load of cars that are now parking somewhere else. There's and then additional car parking, but then also electric vehicle charging points. It is, is the idea essentially that there's going to be, will there be fewer cars overall? Will there be fewer cars sort of per so many people? Um, and is the idea that it's kind of mainly pushing and incentivizing cycling and electric cars? Just if you could just kind of clarify what the sort of vision is. Yeah, sure. Uh, the vision is pretty much we're doubling the the workspace uh, and the number of persons visiting the premises and it's a small increase in the number of car parking uh, so i mean it's, it's not a 50 percent increase in the car park it's about six in total and of there's 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 uh, electric charging points uh, the idea is not just the car parking is but how the car parking is managed so before where you provide it with a car park in space where you can just come and park all day. The idea is that if you need to come and park all day, you will put those in advance. So it's essentially managed by a parking management plan. And that is actually conditioned uh, as part of this application where they will need to provide a detailed parking management plan. I think we've got an outline one. And the idea there is to try and reduce the reliance on the car to drive to this development unless you absolutely need it. And in that case, it's not something that you'd be automatically granted where you have a car seven days a week, you'll book it when you need it. So although the car parking space, some has been reprovided, uh, when you look at the total quantum in terms of what's being reprovided, it's pretty much doubling the space of half the car parking uh, compared to the existing development. 
Uh, and to add to that, th there's a travel plan to supplement the people traveling to and from development by most of the modes of transport. Do you want to add anything? Um, we probably haven't got a huge amount more to add to that aside from um, just saying obviously the nature of the use, most of the vehicles associated with it are going to be the, the use itself, so the industrial processes and, and vehicles visiting the site rather than as you might expect with say an office where people drive to work and park the car and then leave. So it's 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 mainly to do with the uses rather than people commuting to it as a location. Thank you. Councillor White. Thanks, Chair. This is probably another one for Maurice. Um, so I, I'd just like to know whether this uh, development uh, represents an, an increase in permeability for uh, walking and cycling and whether regard has been paid to kind of um, uh, uh, plan for the future to allow further permeability in that regard if uh, adjacent sites come up for development in the future? Well, in, in terms of the site, in terms of permeability, it's, it's a huge increase from the previous development in terms of um, the links, that, in terms of the, the walking and cycling links to and across the site, linking in uh, from Vale Road to, to the neighbouring road, so that, that's definitely an improvement. I think we've also sought a contribution as part of this um, development proposal to look at uh, a more sustainable mode of transport in terms of the future um, LTN proposal that's coming into this area, which will hugely improve uh, pro and build for walking and cycling and, and restrict vehicle access to this development uh, from a certain route. Obviously, that's still subject to detail uh, design and feasibility, but we, we are seeking a contribution towards that. So in terms of this development proposal, in terms of pro and build for walking and cycling, it's a huge improvement from on the existing uh, uh, development proposal. And I think the, the applicant is pretty much designed in terms of pedestrian and cycle program built in pretty much fingers across the development. I'm not quite sure if we've got a slide there, but definitely it's an improvement. I'll get in straight away, Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a couple of additional things to add to that. So during the QRP process and, and with consultation with officers, there was a lot of discussion around what would happen to the site immediately to the south of us, should that be redeveloped. So actually we've created a um, an environment where if and when that site comes forward, there is a natural progression of our of pedestrian movements and potentially cyclists, I suppose, through our site, through that neighbour to the south, I forget the name of the street, immediately to the south of their site. So there is an opportunity for north-south permeability um, uh, for pedestrians and potentially for cyclists. So that's kind of looking at a future scenario. And then just in terms of cycling now um we've got i think we're proposing 83 cycle parking spaces with showers and and, and all the sort of paraphernalia that goes with so it's very much kind of focused on making that a, a, a good environment for people to cycle to the site as well thank you councillor bevan yeah well thank the developers for taking this before the qrp panel i'm sure you've got a lot of good suggestions to improve your scheme i've got a couple of questions one perhaps as a design officer, it's probably not politically correct to raise my concerns about all those panels on the roof because sometimes they destroy the attractiveness of a development and they look a complete eyesore. Now, I'm hoping that won't be the case with this development, Richard. I'm sure you can clarify that point. And then I welcome the additional 50k that's being provided for transport issues. And I'm querying with the officers what does S278 mean to secure works for pavements in the area? Is there a sum attached to that or how does that work? And then my last point is, as Councillor Rice said about the cladding, will you be planning to employ Haringey's Council's building control officers? Because we have a really good team and, and to be quite honest, we have total confidence in that team. That was four, four or five points, Councillor Bevan, but thank you very much. <laughs> OK, Could you... yeah, I think we'll go to Richard first on the solar panels, if you can. Thank you. Um, as far as I know, the solar panels are in line with the pitch of the roof. Um, they're not. Um, they're, 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 it's not a flat roof. It's, uh, they're gently pitched roofs. Uh, James talked about the asymmetric roofs. That's where the, the roof the, 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 the roof is aligned so that there's a gentle slope on the south side and a steep slope on the north side. 
so they're perfectly enabled to have um, solar panels on the gently sloping south facing roof and then they've got the gentle um, conventional fixtures on the other blocks which should have solar panels in in the plane of the roof and that's certainly the way it should be done I assume that is the way it's done I'm pretty certain it is and then Maurice just um do you want to uh, clarify about the two, Section 278 agreement? Yes, uh, sure, Councillor Bevan. So Section 278 agreement is a highways legal agreement to secure uh, highways works. There's footways, crossovers, uh, the trees that you've seen on the drawing that they've um, highlighted on, on, on Vale Road. So that agreement is similar to a Section 106 agreement, but this one is under the Highways Act. So what we'll do once the developer um, has got some detailed design together, we will look at what the improvements, what improvements are required to the highways network. So including removing those crossovers, constructing new crossovers, some repaving the footways, the tree pits I've mentioned. Uh, and what we'll do then is that from that drawing, we'll come up with an estimate and go into a legal agreement where the developer will pay us that money to implement those highways works. So it's similar to a 106 where we secure funding from the developer, but this section 27 on the Highways Act only deals with highways related work in terms of implementation by the Highways Authority or the agent of the Highways Authority. Hopefully that answers your question, but I'm happy to follow up if it's not clear. Do we not put a financial figure to that agreement at this present time or yeah. is that left for further it, negotiation? It, it's left for further negotiating, Councillor, because we will need to see the, the detailed highways drawing. So what you're seeing at the minute is a layout. So we'll need to see the construction of the pavement. Uh, we'll need to see what depth we need to reconstruct the footway to. We need to see what state the actual carriageway is in after they've done their construction. So we may need to do some resurfacing work there. So it's, it's left to further ne negotiations, but this is normally a very straightforward one because it's pretty much based on areas and quantities. And then we have a rate that we apply as the highways authority for, for that area in terms of the quantities. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, councillor saying? Building control. Sorry, yes, I knew there was one more. Uh, that's a question for the applicant team. Given my clients nodding, I think that's a yes. They're happy to use uh, the council's building control officers. Has that answered all the questions? OK, I thought I'd counted, but I've seen missed one. Uh, Councillor. Yeah, I've just got a couple of points. Um, on page 24, under carbon reduction, you say it is proposed to provide a temporary communal gas fired heating system prior to connection to the decentralised energy network den when this becomes available. Is there a time frame for this? This has been talked about for a couple of years now and I've seen no sign of any den. So uh, that's the first question. Uh, second question was on page 27 um, and it was about land contamination. Um, does it mean, I wasn't absolutely clear what, um, what this went on, and on page 35, the condition, does it mean that they have to soil test and, and then clean the ground or remove to toxic materials? Can, can you explain that a bit, please? Um, I'll bring um, uh, Mr Shizovsky in. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just on the decentralised energy network, um, this is sort of sort of slightly wider than this particular application, but it is referred to. Um, yes, there is a council proposal working on a decentralised energy network across the borough. Um, it it um, went to cabinet just in December, so only seven or eight months ago, um, to approve an outline business case, um, and then it will come back to cabinet sometime in 2023 for a full business case. So there is a very live stream of work that's progressing on that, just to reassure on that basis. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the land co contamination. Yes, um, at the, at the moment, um, it, it's it's not absolutely clear on what will happen. There's um, steps to go through in terms of investigation, as you mentioned, in terms of taking samples of the soil and understanding what's in there and where it is and and how best to deal with that. Often the answer is to to remove that and and take it to landfill, but um, sometimes the answer is to just cap that and, and keep it where it is rather than disturb it and send it up into the air. So um, that condition will ask the developer to go through those steps, come up with 
um, a, a correct approach and um, get that signed off by our environmental health pollution officer. Thank you. Councillor Coley Harris. I was wondering if the applicant can give us a flavour of the sort of businesses they expect to be coming in on site, particularly the uh, what was referred to as the units with active frontage, the, the street facing ones. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think it's relevant to remind ourselves that um, the ownership also includes the existing Florentia village. And actually that kind of really fits neatly with um, my clients kind of future aspirations for the site. Um, they really want to build on the success of Florentia as, as, a, as its own little community and they want to just basically extend that into the site. So it's you know, anything from coffee roasters to fabricators to to all that sort of stuff. I mean, they're not going to be turning anybody away, but there's certainly a spirit that they want to maintain from the village and, and carry that across into this development. Any any more questions? No. OK, so we'll now move to the recommendation and I would like to ask Robin McNocker to confirm the recommendation with a summary of any changes. Thank you, Chair. Yes, recommendation is to grant permission subject to conditions and the section 106 as set out in the report and the addendum. Thank you. OK, so we move to the resolution. So all those in favour of granting permission. Unanimous. Yep. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Sorry, the vice chair just reminded me. Um, all those in favour, it was unanimous. He said, I have to say, is anyone against? <laughs> no one against. Thank you. It. Moving on. So, um, so we're now on to item eight, which is um, uh, five seven three five seven five Lordship Lane, um, and the proposal is demolition of existing buildings and redevelopment of site to provide 17 affordable residential units with use uh, use class C3 with landscaping and other associated works. Uh, and the recommendation is to grant. Uh, the planning officer here is Christopher Smith. The applicants, uh, Mark Slay and Peter Jeffrey. Oh, yes, okay. Um, so can I ask the planning officer Christopher Smith to introduce this report, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, this application is for the redevelopment of the existing industrial buildings at uh, 573 to 575 Lordship Lane. Uh, so the key elements of this development are the demolition of the existing buildings, a uh, new four storey building, 17 new affordable homes, two three bedroom homes, two wheelchair user homes, uh, a high quality design that respects the adjacent conservation areas, a high quality residential accommodation within, uh, a play and communal amenity space on site and two blue badge parking spaces. So um, the existing industrial buildings are located to the rear of a petrol station. The surroundings though are mainly residential. The Knoll Park conservation area is located to the south and the Lordship Lane conservation area is immediately to the east. And the Mosel Brook is culverted uh, within um, a culvert to the rear of the site. So these images show how the site currently appears from Lordship Lane and Mosel Avenue. 
The existing buildings are mostly visible in the top left image next to the petrol station. So this is the current view from above with the existing two storey buildings. And this is how the site would look with the proposed development. So the scheme is of three storeys with a setback roof level and a sizable communal garden at rear. This is the view from Lordship Lane. The north elevation is designed to enable the petrol station to be redeveloped in the future. And this is the view from Mosel Avenue. The development is not significantly visible from within the conservation areas. So this is the, uh, the layout plan. It shows that there is a good separation distance from existing dwellings. The main access to the site is off Mosel Avenue to the south, and there is a substantial increase in landscaping across the site. This image shows a typical upper floor layout and the proposed green roof. So to summarise, um, in terms of land use principles, there is a loss of unsuitable employment floor space, but this is outweighed by the benefits of new affordable housing. There will be a financial contribution provided towards local employment initiatives in lieu of this lost space. The scheme will provide new affordable housing in the form of 17 affordable homes. That's 60% London affordable rent and 40% immediate sale. The council has the first option to purchase these affordable homes. Um, as previously mentioned, two um, of, the, of the units are three bedroom uh, sized and two of them are wheelchair user homes. So that's 11% in, um, in both cases. It's a high quality design. The um, quality review panel has reviewed the scheme and says that the panel supports the development's residential use and overall scale. The panel's recommendations in this review have been integrated into the design through discussions with officers. And the scheme now has support from the council's design and conservation officers. The scheme has a high residential quality. 59% of the homes would be dual aspect. It meets London plan space standards in terms of the um, size of the units and the uh, amenity space. There's a communal amenity and play space uh, provided on site at the rear and 73% uh, carbon reduction on site. In terms of the residential amenity, the existing neighbours are 18 metres away to the south and 13 metres to the east. There is no material impact on the amenity of existing residents. In terms of parking, it is a car free development with two off street blue badge parking spaces provided. High quality cycle parking would also support the scheme and a range of sustainable transport initiatives. So the recommendation uh, is that this development is considered acceptable and is in, in accordance with policy. So officers recommend the committee resolves to grant planning permission subject to conditions and planning obligations as set out in the committee report. Thank you. I'll just end up on an image here briefly. Yep, I've also got a uh, some 3D imagery we can run through as per the previous uh, submission. Yeah, apologise for the window, the window nature of this, but um, you better view the scheme. Right in there. Right. OK, it's full screen now. So we can see the uh, building in the centre of the image. You can see that the surrounding areas are generally of a three storey built form and that it doesn't appear uh, significantly greater than the other buildings in the area. 
Uh, that includes the conservation areas, which is, you know, this is the view from the north. So there's conservation areas to the south just behind and to the, the left hand side here, which is to the uh, to the east. And this uh, next image uh, shows how the building would appear in the, the road junction, which is in the conservation area at Lordship Lane. So you can see here that um, with the foliage on that street corner, the block isn't visible in any public views. Um, and there, there are all the images I have, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so any questions? So I've got Councillor Buxton, please. Um, yeah, just a quick one. That uh, last image of the, the where the, it's obstructed by foliage, isn't that just in the case in summer? What about winter? Yeah, I can show you how this will uh, look in winter as well. Is one of the options. Uh, good, good orange. I did see this earlier. Sorry, might be settings. I thought it was the other. No, I, I did see it earlier, but I can't remember where it is. Environment. No. Mm. Uh, these are just these are policy designations. Yeah, right? it's model control setting. Settings. No. About. No, that's just render settings. Mm. Okay, try. But the chair, if it is, if it, if it is too much yeah, trouble, this is... Before. It's all the option earlier. <laughs> you can imagine dropping the leaves a little bit. But, um, <laughs> Over there. I just want to make that point. Right. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's, it's easy when you know how. Um, so it's completely removes the tree, but um, clearly you can get, a, get the gist of what it might look like in winter. So you can uh, see it in uh, winter conditions through the site. Not sure if that tree is deciduous or not, deciduous or not a bit maybe. Um, but it's, it's still, uh, it's not significantly visible, um, you know, throughout the year. And for most public views, uh, including within the conservation areas, it won't be um, clearly visible. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just on the uh, affordability mix, um, just to be clear, the 17 units, 60% uh, uh, London affordable rent, 40% intermediate. I make that 10.2 units and 6.8 units. So is it 10 and uh, 10 and 7 or is it 11 and 6? Uh, yes, it's 10 and 7, yeah. 10 and 7, OK, so slightly less than 60, 40. Um, uh, and uh, the option for the council to purchase, is it just on those 10 London affordable rent units or is it on all 17? It's it's on all units. On all units. And in that case, given that uh, London affordable rent is defined as discount on the market rate that would otherwise be charged for that rent that would otherwise be charged for that property, does that affect the amount that the council would have to pay for the, for the two different types of uh, properties? Um, in, in my understanding, the negotiations on that are, are a separate process, um, so it's, it's not um, something that we necessarily consider at this stage. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, just wanted. To, uh, sorry, I just wanted to. There is something else, a different thing that I just wanted to clarify. This is a bit of a naive question, but I hope that as a relatively new member of the planning committee, um, it's okay for me to ask that. Um, I think that's probably my phone, isn't it? Um, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a, yeah, a bit of a soundtrack. Um, so it's it's um, paragraph six point eight point four. Um, I mean, this is just something that's common to a lot of the applications that come to planning subcommittee. We're talking about the um, this is something that councillor say raised at the last meeting about the carbon offset payment. So I'd just like to get some clarification because what we're being told in the majority of the applications that are coming is that it's not feasible to make this particular 
uh, for this particular um, development to be carbon neutral. Therefore, in order to fulfil the, the 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 carbon neutral requirements, an offset is being paid. So, um, obviously, the development is then contributing to climate change. In 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 what way is that money that's being paid then? working in the other direction how is that money removing that extra carbon that's being generated from the atmosphere apologies if that's a naive question and the answer is obvious uh yeah thank you for your question uh so i understand that you are asking how the money is spent uh once the applicants pay for it is that correct Basically, yes, but also I suppose it's a wider thing that if the majority of developments aren't actually carbon neutral and we're declaring carbon, you know, that we are carbon neutral because lots of carbon offset money is being paid, how is that actually overall not contributing to climate change? Uh, good question. I'll answer your first question first, if that's okay. Um, so we have um we have a uh, a number of ways for us to be spending the carbon offset money uh currently we are spending it on uh, fuel poor homes so retrofitting people's properties uh in fuel properties that's uh, primarily aimed at uh, fabric efficiencies um sorry that's my phone um and we also have the community carbon fund uh, that is currently being spent on uh, projects within the community to deliver carbon offset projects. Um, they don't deliver a one for one kind of ratio in terms of carbon reduction. Uh, that is for a number of reasons. Uh, it's difficult to measure that directly. Um, we're also uh, kind of ignoring in that sense the sort of community empowerment, uh, which is obviously not a measurable carbon reduction. Um, uh, measure so um, that means that people would be empowered as a result of projects to also deliver carbon reduction uh, um, on their own um, so that is just two avenues currently that we uh, are spending money on and further uh, avenues will be used as well um, the full list of how we can spend our money is is listed in the planning obligations SBD uh, so I can look that up if you want to know about the full list um, in terms of schemes not delivering carbon reduction overall, um, that is obviously a concern. <laughs> uh, and it's also worth noting that the, the policy currently only addresses the regulated emissions uh, when a building is in operation. So that actually excludes um, uh, anything that isn't a plug-in load uh, when you're using your building. Um, and it also it excludes any embodied emissions with the construction of a building uh, and when you're dem uh, demolishing it, et cetera. Um, so this is where planning policies in the future need to be addressing that to uh, increase the reduction. Um, we're also expecting that technology will be improving so that these reductions will be um, increasing on site. So sorry for the long answer. I hope that answers your question. That's great. Thank you very much. Obviously, you know, it's a lot to discuss and not necessarily relevant to this application, but it would be good to have a, a, a fuller conversation on that in, in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor White. Councillor Corley Harrison. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a not a, it's quite a small building you know, at four storeys. Was there ever a desire to go higher to get more units on site? I suppose my first question and then in uh well i think particularly in that render the, it's a very red brick that's on display as one of the tones one of the two tones um perhaps that misrepresents it but do we have a sense of what the actual color is going to be for the brickwork because there's there's a darker red and a lighter red is that to is that to color match existing brickwork um on the north park estate or or neighboring properties and then are there plans to bring forward the petrol station development as part of, an, part of the allocation? And on page 97, the graphic which shows the petrol station entrance um, and that side of the development, the development to me looks quite oppressive from that design um, vantage point. Obviously that would matter much less if the petrol station development came forward um was it designed with something in mind for it to come forward was it designed to 
blend in. I mean, that's probably the most visible bit, actually. And it probably is the weakest design of it versus that, you know, which is a lot, I think, a lot nicer. Maybe that was one for Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, it's not a site allocation. It's a, it's, it's a site that's come forward uh, from the applicant uh, who presumably owns the RK Windows business, which has a right of way across the petrol station, but they're not connected to presumably the owners of the petrol station, which is a separate business. Um, so obviously uh, it's designed uh, to turn its back on the petrol station um, because it's got to cope with both the existence of the petrol station there and also um, the possibility, I would say likelihood, but it's, we can only say it's a possibility that the petrol station will get redeveloped at some point in the fairly short term, you know, because petrol stations are presumably going to be much less needed as petrol cars disappear. Um, so it's, it, it's a fairly blank elevation that turns its back on the petrol station so that uh, residents are not required to walk across the ugly, um, unpleasant, unsafe petrol station forecourt to get to their homes. They can get to their homes from the Colden Court side uh, through Noel Park Estate. Um, but it's designed so that uh, if, a, if a redevelopment of the petrol station happens, that could also be built right up to it. Uh, it will probably be built as a, as a wing or something like that. It might be a, a C shape or an L shaped or a T shaped plan. Um, but uh, we don't know what might happen with that. Um, so it's designed to be reasonably flexible and to, to give lots of potential for a development on the petrol station site. But it obviously does begin to um, force them to um, to design it in certain ways to, 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 to not look up the, the kitchen and bathroom windows. That are looking onto it, but um, it's, it's it's not particularly complicated. And yes, the brickwork is selected uh, to match both the um, uh, Lordship Lane and Noel Park Estate existing brickwork, and obviously that will be um, subject to the condition uh, of uh, approval of detail and the samples of the bricks. But yes, it's designed with an intention to match the existing neighbouring brick. On the height, yes. Well, I don't think, um, I mean, I felt it was um, the, the right height at four storeys. Obviously, the context varies from two to three, and, 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 and there are a few buildings along Lordship Lane at four storeys. Um, but, you know, the immediate neighbours are the two storey houses to the south in the Noel Park Estate, and the three storey blocks in the Coldham Court Estate and in, 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 along Lordship Lane to the east, you know, the Lordship Lane Estate. So, those, th those three storey blocks along Lordship Lane, they're, they're, they've got quite tall roofs, so this will be about the same sort of height as that. Uh, I would expect that should the petrol station be redeveloped, it might well be five storeys. Yeah, but that will be on the street frontage. It's the right sort of relationship, I think, to have a slightly taller building on the street frontage stepping down uh, as you go behind the block and, and into the quieter residential side streets. Councillor Bevan. Yeah, I know this is near a petrol station, so I'm not... I'm just a bit worried there might be some issues discovered when you start the building work with contamination, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just wondering whether you're considering employing Haringey's building control. Mr. Jeffrey, do you want to answer that? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yes, absolutely, to be the answer. Um, Councillor Say. Yeah, this question is about the district uh, energy network again, I'm afraid, uh, for a different reason. 6.83, page 112. Um, air source heat pumps would provide heating to the residential properties. The development must be designed to enable a future connection to a district energy system when this is available. But why does it have to do that if they've got air, air source heat pumps? Um, so this is acknowledging that a route for the DEN connection might or might not be going anywhere near the sites. Uh, so it is being designed to allow for the uh, passing of building 
regulations uh, for a low carbon heat source because it's not certain whether by the time that they need to achieve a low carbon heat source that they will be able to connect to the den. So that's why the air source heat pump solution has been uh, proposed. And then a den connection will be happening if and when it does come close enough. Does that answer it? No, no. Why do they need it if they've got air source heat pumps? So at the time uh, when that's relevant, a feasibility will be undertaken, whether it's uh, feasible and viable to be connecting uh, the sites. The aim is for other developments nearby to also be connecting. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a, uh, it's a more efficient way of uh, supplying heat. Yes, sorry, can I just bring uh, Rob? Yeah, thank you. And just to add to what Susanna said, um, whilst air source heat pumps are are a good um, way of getting energy and heat um, for the development. Um, the decentralised energy network is generally seen as more sustainable, lower carbon, and in the long term might end up being more affordable um, than air source heat pumps. Air source heat pumps use um, electricity, um, and there's all sorts of things that can happen with electricity prices, etc. So that's why it's built in to future proof this development to be flexible to use different sources of energy until, as Suzanne says, the den can kick in and it can connect. So, um, so that's why um, it's still appropriate to have the potential den connection later on. Councillor Over. Um, just we've been discussing how it's um, the proximity of the petrol station to the actual. Um, premises and I'm just kind of concerned about fumes and exhaust that could potentially affect um, residents as especially as it's a family sized home so you'll probably have a, a, uh, many families in the building and just wonder if there was any investigations that were carried out just to kind of assess the levels of fumes and exhaust from the petrol station. Yes, so um, the site is, is close to the petrol station and also the nearby road. There was an air quality assessment uh, submitted with the application that was found to have no negative impact on the properties. In terms of the um, the fumes from the petrol pumps, there's um, DEFRA guidance which suggests that you can, um, residential properties can be built um, uh, as long as they're no closer than 10 metres from the pumps. Uh, that's that's the cutoff for the DEFRA guidance. This, this development is um, it's at least 13 metres from the canopy where the pumps are and, and subsequently even further from the actual pumps themselves. So um, that, that was felt not to be a, not to be an issue in this case. Thank you. So are there, oh, Councillor Corley Harrison. The applicant was raring to say something, so maybe he will in response, but um, uh, the condition to, to start development is three years. Is the applicant willing to bring that down to two years? Um, I think given the current situation with regard to build cost uh, inflation and the issues with that, um, it wouldn't be responsible for us to give a declaration that we could bring forward the application with any certainty within the two year period. Obviously, it would be an aspiration for us to do so. As uh, Richard mentioned, the uh, the site is owner occupied. Uh, the business has plans to relocate. Um, so there is um, plans in motion to make it happen, but um, the detail of construction, et cetera, I think we would be prudent to retain the three year period. Um, if I may, Chair, just to response to the um, the fumes point, which is a very good one, something that um, perplexed us throughout the design of the project. But um, thanks to Richard's actual uh, very good and clear um, recommendations through our design process, we actually um, reorientated the building so that it wasn't overlooking the petrol station at all, looking back out and creating that um, blank facade, the, the one that you commented on isn't as attractive as it might be, but that is all about, as well as enabling the petrol station to come forward, uh, ensuring that the residents have um, uh, or don't experience the worst of being located so close to the um, petrol filling station. Thank you, Chair, Councillor. Councillor Rice. A couple of points. The first point is, it was mentioned earlier in the discussion about the colour of the bricks. 
it seems to me the simplest thing would be to actually uh, have the various coloured bricks available at the meeting so we can actually look at it and satisfy ourselves which would be the most appropriate colour. I mean, certainly you can ask the developers to do that. Let's bring half a dozen bricks in so we can look at them and make our judgment then. Uh, also, I'm a bit concerned that no member of the public who lives near that petrol station made any sort of, I might have missed it, and I apologize if I have missed it, made any suggestion of being unhappy with the how with additional housing develops so near a petrol station. It seems to be the natural thing that people want to come along to this meeting and make us aware of their concerns, but there's, there's no one in, in sight about it at all. Councillor, yeah, I'll, I'll just take the, the question on bricks again. Um, we, we have in the past brought bricks where, where I think it, it's absolutely crucial. I think in this instance, there's a number of options that um, we would find acceptable and we do have to provide that flexibility to um, let the applicant go and procure those. Um, we do assess that very rigorously when it comes in, but it can be a number of months or even years down the line before they're at a stage where they can give us the exact brick. So in a way, to give you that level of detail could be somewhat misleading. So um, it, I, I know your point, and if, if there is a, a particular brick that really um, is critical to the, to the scheme's acceptability, we, we would certainly bring that along. Um, can anyone, I mean, presumably um, all the, con the local residents have been consulted and notified and um, so, ev as with the usual, everyone's been notified about that. Can we just address Councillor Rice's point? Yes, thank you. Yes, in this instance, um, because there's a major application, there's, there's a number of notifications required, um, namely the, the letters to um, all adjoining properties and um, further afield and a, a number of site notices um, within the area. Um, and also because of the conservation area that they'll have been um, an advert in the press as well. So um, I think in this case, um, yeah, the residents haven't chosen to, to come this evening. And Mr. Jeffrey. Sorry, we also uh, off our own back uh, employed a, a community consultation consultant, uh, went through a process of um, consulting directly as well as the consultation that the council undertakes and um, completed a statement of community involvement in support of the application. So we did, we were mindful of how close the potential development is to people's houses. So we went above and beyond in trying to ensure that any concerns residents had were uh, allayed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, OK, so um, we'll now uh, move to the uh, recommendation and like to ask Robbie McNocker to confirm the recommendation with a summary of any changes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, in this instance, there was a suggestion from Councillor Collie Harrison for two year permission. Um, as we've heard from the applicant, um, that, that doesn't provide sufficient flexibility. So um, that, that's not part of the recommendation. So the recommendation is as set out in the report. Thank you. So we'll move to the resolution. All those in favour, please show. And I think that's unanimous, but anyone against? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All those in favour, uh, uh, unanimous and no, no, no one against. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Right, um, so we'll now move on to item nine, which is um, planning, which is um, 0081, 15 to 19 Garman Road, N17, OUR, pages 185 to 250. The proposal is demolition of the existing industrial buildings and redevelopment to provide a new building for manufacturing, warehouse or distribution with ancillary offices on ground first and second floor frontage together with 10 uh, self-contained design studio offices on the third floor. This is a full planning application. Uh, the recommendation is to grant. Uh, the planning officer here is Kwaku Bosman Gamera uh, and the applicant is uh, Mark Willingdale, agent, uh, Ross Inangt and Mark Scott. Are you, are you Mark Willingdale? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so I'll ask um, Mr. Bosman Gamera to um, present um, to introduce the report, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Proposal is to demolish the existing industrial building and redevelopment to provide a new building for manufacturing, warehousing, distribution with ancillary offices to the ground, first and second floor, frontage together with a 10 self-contained design studio on the third floor. The site is outlined in red. It's a single story structure industrial shed with a very narrow span, low eave height, which cover the entire site. The site is bounded to Gamma Road to the west, Unicorn Works, which is number 21 to 25 to the north. If members recall doing our site visit, this was the site that has been cleared and it's also got a similar planning permission granted about a year ago for a similar height industry unit. And then to the south is number 13, Gamma Road, Water Midway, which is a 1055 is directly to the east with access via Gamma Road and of course it provides convenient access to the 406 to the north. Access to the site is from Gamma Road on the main frontage and at the rear of the site is a separate former industrial shed to the south which is the same freehold ownership of the applicant which is outlined in blue. The surrounding area which you can see from the aerial photo, is mainly industrial, comprised of industrial buildings of similar uses. And of course, the building that was destroyed by fire, which is to the north, which has now been cleared for a similar development. This is the street view along the south Gamma Road, and our building is the one positioned on the left-hand side. The main issues are the principle of development, design and appearance, the impact of the adjoining occupiers, parking and highway, and of course, sustainability and energy. These are outlined in the officer's report. The principle of development is considered acceptable in this system. The site is designated strategic industrial location which effectively means we have to say that the land for range of industrial users ranging from B1, which is now your E class, and then your B2 and your B8. The development will maintain industrial building businesses, storage and distribution, i.e. the B1, B8 and then the rest. The sites will provide enhanced employment users and of course economic benefit particularly in terms of providing more intensive use and of course securing a modern and viable use for the site and also contribute to the delivery of a good employment floor space in Harringate. With regards to design and appearance, the current site is a single story structure. The proposed will effectively will double in height. This will not detract from the current context of the site, given the approval 
about a year ago to the north of the site, which will be almost the same similar sort of height. So it will not be out of keeping. It will be quite, quite similar in terms of the wider context and also to the immediate adjoining property. The ground floor of the site, which is basically have the loading base on the ground floor with the access coming from Gamma Road, of ancillary office on the ground floor, and then the bay, the loading base. The first floor is got a very relatively small office with a void on the first floor. The second floor effectively emulates what's on the first floor, which is a very relatively small office with a void on the second floor. And then the third floor contains the flexible studios on the upper floors. The reason for such a high roof floor to ceiling clearly is to, uh, to accommodate more modern industrial building, uh, industrial machinery and equipment as well. So you need this sort of floor to ceiling height in order to achieve this often. Overall, it is considered that the proposal will be a general improvement to the character and appearance of the area and maintaining appropriate industrial build form in keeping with the aesthetic of the locality and of course the wider context as well. The main frontage along Gamma Road will reflect the commercial nature of the proposal. The materials will be of course steel frame with cladding, with steel cladding to reflect more modern warehousing in the surrounding area. With regards to impact on amenities of our joining occupier, perhaps if I go to the aerial photo, I think that'll be much more vivid. No, don't mean. The nearest residential property is some 250 meters away from the site. And the use of a site will not change from what the current uses. It will still remain industrial within the B uses. And of course, it will be wholly compatible with the strategic industrial land, which the designation of the site is. This, given the you know, significant distance from residential property, it is not anticipated that, that the proposal will cause any significant harm to the adjoining occupiers or the wider area it will clearly be compatible with the surrounding area in terms of the use proposed. With regards to parking and transport, uh, the existing site benefits from two crossovers. So you can see the crossover to the north and then the crossover to the south, which are adjacent to number 13. The aim here is to propose is to reduce the number of the crossovers and create a singular access point from the front within the forecourt. This will basically will provide access into the forecourt, providing three car parking space within the front, which I will show on the plan. Yeah, so you got three car parking spaces, including the disabled parking to the front and also granting access to the loading bay on the proposed ground floor. The widening of the crossover will clearly on the southern side will need to be shared with number 11 to the south. The proposal, of course, will have to be done by section 278, which is to improve the current arrangement on the site and also to make it much more usable friendly. The proposal shows six long stay spaces within inside of the building on the ground floor, and then 10 cycle storage to the front. So in total, 16 has been provided. This is well in a sex of the minimum requirements, so is policy compliant. The highway officer is satisfied with the delivery and services demand associated with the development. And of course, they have suggested some condition which is outlined in the addendum to be imposed. The conditions include cycle storage detail, parking design and management plan, 
delivery and servicing plan, and of course, highway parking highway condition and construction management plan as well. In terms of sustainability, the development achieved a reduction of 60 per 60% carbon dioxide emission on site, which is policy compliant, and they are achieved through the main is listed down here. You got air heat pump, solar PV, roof light, and of course extensive green roof, which you can see on the plan here on the roof plan. So you've got the two uh, source heat on both sides with solar panels, which is basically that are around the roof, and then the roof lights for ventilation, and of course extensive green roof which is also acceptable in terms of urban green factor as well. I think this will go in many ways to reduce carbon footprint. Officer has recommended appropriate conditions uh, in order to achieve appropriate benefits. And of course, carbon off off offsetting has also been imposed to make sure we achieve that. With regards to air quality and contamination, uh, Council, Council High, uh, Pollution Officer, they have reviewed the application and they've raised no objection at all on these grounds. But of course, a condition will be imposed to mitigate any potential contaminant on the site if anything was to be found. Yeah. And of course, I think one of the prevalent issues when we went on site was the amount of rubbish which has been scattered along the industrial units. In this scheme, they propose a number of bins along the frontage and of course it's on the curb side so it makes it much more easier for a private collector to basically to get hold of of course with industrial units council don't have control over these sort of things so they are all done by private developers to do that and of course the the position and the location where they are is easily accessible from the main road and to conclude the proposed development, I think, is acceptable in terms of adequate replacement and enhancement of an industrial employment floor space. It's also provide a flexible floor space to support small to medium sized businesses that need land and space. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So are there any questions of clar clarification questions from the committee? Councillor Babham. Well, I think you know what I'm going to ask. <laughs> In view of what Dame Judith Hackett said about QRP inspectors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can you confirm for me that you will be used in Haringey's building control? Can you just repeat that? Otherwise, it might not be recorded. Yes, we're aiming to use the local authority building control department. Thank you. OK, um, Councillor Rice. Yeah, just a different sort of question. When the HS, when the high speed train being talked about, there was some suggestion that it will come above ground round about where the site is being planned. Is is that a complete no no now or is it still being held in the bills? Just take that one thing. Thank you, Councillor. Um the um crossrail two um there is um on the alignment with close to this site, but um this site isn't safeguarded. So um the safeguarded areas are um Further south at um, the retail park at, at Tottenham Hill, um, that, that, that's um, going to be where the, the trains would come out of um, the ground and, and then travel along track. So um, this being further north of that um, isn't affected by that safeguarding directive. So that is still in place, even though funding for that project is unclear at the moment. Um, but it, it doesn't affect this site. If it was the case that the, the train did come along quite near it. Uh, that would be acceptable, wouldn't it? 
Oh, well, they have to have flat, but no, you don't have to have flat mission to do the real work. But, 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 but how would it be dealt with? I'm not clear. Yeah, um, good question. It, it effectively um, can blight the land to some extent. Um, so uh, the safeguarding direction puts limitations um, on the local planning authority in, in terms of what they can approve, um, because that can affect um, the, the ability to deliver the project. So, um, for example, we, we've only granted some temporary permissions on, on safeguarded sites um, because um, we know that in future they may come forward um, to need to be used for Crossrail 2. I just wanted to ask about local employment clauses. Will there be an opportunity for this? Joe, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, it, the he section heads of terms, section 106 heads of terms um, should include that as, well, as one of our standard obligations. So um, I would include that in a recommendation to um, add um, our standard local employment clauses um, in those heads of terms. Uh, Councillor Warren. Thank you. Um, I think this is kind of a naive question, but I just thought it might be helpful to clarify for me as a new councillor and a new planning committee member. Because um, <clears throat> I note that it kind of says in, in the proposal, without these conditions, particularly around environmental offsetting, there would be unacceptable levels of CO2 emissions and so on. So um, in terms of the, the conditions that have been put forward, um, I know there's like a specific sum outlined for the carbon offsetting, but there's also reference to like a sustainability plan or something like that. Is that something that has to kind of be formulated in an in-depth way now? And and do, do, like would we then sort of vote on that again in the future, or is it is it that that process is kind of handed over to the officers and and you kind of scrutinise um, that plan? And and I guess. In, in terms of making sure that those obligations and conditions are met, how does that work? Thank you. Sure, yep, yeah, great question. Um, just in, in terms of, um, I think the, the, the points set out at 2.6 are probably what you're referring to. So um, those basically put in the, in the hands of, of officers following this committee that if the applicant doesn't enter into the 106 for the um, heads of terms set out above that we could refuse in those grounds. Um, so it gives us the opportunity to do that. And if then those were addressed at a subsequent application, we could then um, approve without bringing that back to committee. So um, we shouldn't be imposing an obligation unless it would result in that refusal. So um, that, that's sort of one of the fundamental principles and, and the same as a condition. Um, in this case, we've allowed some flexibility in, in the condition um, to, to have some further clar clarity down the, the road. Um, if it was a, a more complicated building, a residential block, um, we, we would um, probably be a bit tighter on that and, and expect um, less fle flexibility. They, they should be complying with the energy statement they've submitted. Um, so um, what happens after that is um, once permission is granted, then they come to discharge those conditions um, and that's a delegated matter. So um, it, most of those issues are quite technical um, and we would be going to experts such as Suzanne um, to get sign off on that and, and deal with that under delegated powers. So that um, just going on to the the um, section 278 legal agreement. Um, so I understand it will involve kind of improving the highway works um, in the area. Um, just wondering whether I know it'll probably include pavements, um, but also would it include kind of like the whole landscaping greenery in the area? Because um, I noticed that there's not quite a lot there and just to kind of go with our agenda of making the area more green, whether that will be considered as part of the agreement. Yeah, possibly it will be. Yeah, I think that's just a good one um, for Maurice to clarify whether um, greening would be possible as, as part of those works or, or whether that would just be limited to um, hard surfaces. Um, Councillor, uh, we can consider trees as part of um, Section 27 agreement and we do consider some sustainable drainage, but considering the nature of the scheme in, in terms of the industrial nature, I think the most we, we could ask for here some trees to be uh, included if possible. Uh, and we, if, if you state that on a, as a condition, uh, then we can definitely include that in the Section 278 um, agreement.
Any any more questions? Uh, just to draw attention to 2.3, the date is wrong. So is there an indication you could give us of how much time we'll have for the section 106? I think perhaps best I clarify that um, th that can be ex extended further um, if needed. Um, so that's just a, an indicative date, um, which as it happens is in the past. And yeah, I um, should have should have been updated. Pretty quick um, match that one. <laughs> so yeah, I think probably um, we should include in a recommendation to amend okay. that to the fourth of September. Do can you just say what sort of time do you think we had for that? Do you know? Um, we would endeavour to do it as, as soon as possible. I, I would recommend two months, um, and, but um, yes, it, it um, often depends on the speed of, of at which your um, client's exactly. lawyers can move. So um, yeah, two months, I think is reasonable. So, so sorry, we'll negotiate with yourselves to agree a date, will we? Yeah, well, I, um, I would suggest just for the purposes of having a full recommendation that um, we say the 4th of September um, and um, provided that's not a weekend, um, I'll double check in a second. Uh, then, yeah, we, we can then extend that further. Um, so, yeah, for I mean, my fear is that we don't want to run out of time if it's too short. It's the holiday at the moment. So maybe a slightly longer period is, is rather better, actually. Uh, yeah, 4th of October. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. So um, we'll move to the resolution. So can I um, um, ask, uh, we'll move to the recommendation. I'd like to ask Robbie McNocker to confirm the recommendation with a summary of any changes, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, a number of, of changes. Firstly, um, just to note um, the um, additional um, Section 106 head of term in the um, addendum and the amended and additional conditions um, 16 and 22. Um, there's also the amendment to paragraph 2.3 to 2.3 to um, amend the date to the 4th of October 2022 um, and ad an additional head of term um, to secure um, local employment provisions during construction. Over. Just the condition about the is the, would that be included? What I've kind of included to say, yeah. Yes, um, sorry. Um, yes, to amend additional head of term number one and um, to include um, tree provision. Thank you. OK, so we'll um, move to the rev oh, sorry, revolution then. Res uh, resolution. Um, all those in favour, please show. Anyone against? No. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Good night. Thank you. OK. So. <laughs> so we'll we'll move on to um, item 10, which is update on major proposals. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So update on Sorry. Right, sorry, OK, item 10, um, update on major proposals, pages 251 to 266. Um, uh, this is for noting. Are there any questions? So, Councillor Beth. Yeah, I've got three of these items that I just want to mention. The one about Station Road, which is actually going to Cabinet tomorrow, refers to modular buildings. I'm hearing some contacts in the building industry with all the Grenfell regulations coming in that modular buildings and off-site construction are really affected by what they now have to do, can comply with Grenfell stuff. And I've actually been told it makes 
that type of building now not practical uh, whether i'm being told right but that's what i'm being told by someone in the building industry now that's going to cabinet tomorrow night that that item so i was thinking of going to cabinet but i'm raising it here instead you know so whether you can think about that and decide uh, what what to do yes code sir um i i understand that uh, project was put on pause while well, well, some issues were explored. I, I don't know if that's one of them, um, but we, we should hear from the applicant soon um, following that cabinet report on, on whether um, the project is moving forward or not. So um, it, it is beyond um, planning considerations. Um, it's really a, a control matter, but um, I think it, it, it probably will have been looked at in that um, pause on the project. And then I, I just got one other. So there's one here about the straight to Messi at the state. Is talking about uh, two new blocks of 16 storeys. So I'm not prejudging the application, but that's a really dense estate already. Another two blocks of 16 storeys. If you're going to do that, you need to refurbish all the existing blocks at the same time because they're in a the right state and those residents need some, what shall I say, compensation if it does actually get permission. but. That's a really high density estate already, so I'm just drawing that to the attention of the planning officer. Thank you. Yes, yeah, um, th there is potential um, loss of space in that project, so we will we'll be looking at the policies around that and um, how that benefits the wider area very closely. And Councillor Bevan, just to come in on, back on the point on modular units, um, I think that the jury is still out. You have heard uh, various different arguments. Um, some of it is is good in terms of safety of modular units in that they are built in a factory and that the actual building works can be monitored very closely in a sort of factory environment um, rather than on site, which is much more difficult to, to monitor. So in some senses, actually modular units can be better quality and safer and, and including in terms of fire safety. Um, but there are some downsides as well, um, as you have highlighted. So it's still the verdict is still out on that generally. Um, and there's also differences between whether it's low rise or high rise. So obviously high rise is always going to be high risk. Um, whereas low rise modular is much, much lower risk. So um, it's not quite a black and white, you know, good or bad issue. There's there's a mixture of issues to be looked at. Um, and that's something that our building control service look at very closely, as, as, as you know. Um, so it's not quite a black and white um, picture on modular units. Someone else had their hand. Was that Councillor? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, first one's a, a point for the grid for the majors. Can we include postcodes on all of them? Because we've got, for example, 13 Bedford Road. Well, there's at least two Bedford Roads in Haringey, maybe potentially more, actually. Um, I, I mean, I know where most of them are, but Mecca Bingo, if you're new to the committee, new to the area. Um, so if we include that. Um, Crouch Hill seems to have been removed. Is there a reason that that's been removed? Do you know the Oppens? Um, so if we can get an update on that and then also an update on wood ridings and um, Linton uh, Road as well, because it says discussions ongoing for both of those, I think. Yes, um, uh, point noted um, that some of these yeah, are, are almost colloquial names, so it would be helpful to, to have more precise addresses um, and I'll make sure to have that for the next update um, in September. Um, the the old bin site um, we thought wasn't coming forward, so it was taken off the list, and um, it has now moved forward again. So um, I'll make sure to get that added back on. Um, wood writings um, is due for submission um, soon, so um, I think um, possibly by the end of the summer. Um, and Linton Road um, that uh, has had re more recent discussions, um, but not. Um, sort of moving quickly at the moment. So I think there was a pre-app um, possibly last year, and I don't think um, we've we've heard anything since. Rice. There's something going on. We gave permission for the Lots Keepers Cottage on the lease to be redeveloped, but nothing has happened on that. Can you tell us, bring it up there, please? Yes, um, that was one of our longest running um, planning applications. Um, that
that's no longer on the list. That that um, was determined. Um, it, it I think it took um, over a year for that um, issue with the land transfer to, to complete and for us to be able to issue the provision. So um, out of out of no control of our own, that that did take a long time, but has finally gone through and and, um, and has been issued. Any more questions on this item, Councillor Collier? Ashley House, is that part of a site allocation that includes River Park House and the bus depot? And are there plans to bring forward the bus depot? Um, yes. Um, so yes, that's the um, the Levine site. Um, I think we're unclear on who's going to bring that forward. It, it's a site that, that is potentially changing hands, uh, as I understand. Um, so um, colleagues in the regeneration team have done some master planning work for that to, to look at the, the whole picture. Um, and as I understand, um, Arriva are in conversations with developers. Um, I think they did um, request bids for developers. So, so we don't know who their chosen um, developer will be, but I think that will be moving forward fairly soon. Uh, th th that's the big challenge of the, of the site um, is that um, you have to keep that operational um, throughout the development um, and obviously um, span um, all of that. Um, so it, it, it presents major challenges, but um, they do seem to hopefully have found a developer that's willing to take that on and can bring that forward. Yeah, so um, yeah, ground floor um, bus depot with yeah, some some amendments to that. Um, but yeah, th th that's I think um, it's an accessible site, so that, that's quite important for getting drivers and, and people there at at, um, at the hours that they need to start shifts, so that they don't want to move um, from that site. Right, thank you. That um, is to note. So we're on to item eleven: applications determined under delegated powers. <laughs> Pages 267 to 296. Uh, this is um, uh, report is for noting. Are there any questions, please? No, OK, that's to note. So um, item 12, um, urgent business. There are no new items of urgent business. Item 13, date of next meeting is... 11, no, it isn't, Councillor Rice. It's the 11th of July 2022. So thank you very much, Anna. Now close the meeting. It's been a good meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.